All right, we're the customary three minutes into the hour. Uh, we can get started, although it's a small uh, attendee list today, but um, I guess there is a recording as well. So uh, why don't we just go ahead and jump in. Aliche, I see that you have the first yeah. agenda uh, item. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to make you aware about the proposal that I opened a couple of last week, I think. Um, and there is also a work in progress PR. Um, so there was another proposal before this, um, but this is a slightly different. I mean, it's based on the previous one. And okay. yeah, I would like uh, to start the conversation, and especially about the API discussion. Uh, should I summarize a bit uh, uh, the proposal? Do you prefer to read it offline? So I would love to hear uh, basically, yeah, like a summary, maybe what mm -hmm. what changed uh, between the yeah. previous one and this one. Yeah. Um, so actually, I got the comment, uh, especially from Fabian, that the first was a little bit too large in terms of use cases. Um, so this one was one feedback and the second was that basically um, I was modifying the um, virtual machine uh, instance migration object. Uh, that was another feedback. So they want uh, a separate object. So uh, what this um, um, proposal has on, built on top of the other one, I would say uh, is that it creates a new CRDs um, and also um, so in these CRDs we can customize uh, and I'm not targeting local storage migration. So right now this is just a proposal. I would love to have feedback on this, but basically I am focusing on two parts. So either the user specify manually uh, the PVC, the source PVC, I call it in this way, that they want to migrate and create already the objects, so the destination PVCs, or um, we specify uh, the storage class uh, from which we want to migrate uh, and the destination storage class. So mm. basically these are the two flavor of the, of the storage migration. Um, Okay. So some, yeah, and something I would like to have uh, feedback is the recane policy, for example. So, so basically, Qbert now is um, should should um, handle the PVCs that we want to migrate. So, and one of the question I had is what we do with the source PVC. So basically, when we my successfully migrate to the destination storage, what we should do with the um, with the uh, source PVC. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think, I am just thinking just to delete them, but maybe this is a bit similar uh, about the retain policies of PVCs in my opinion. So there are yep. various flavors. So yeah, anyway, uh, there are details uh, about discussion and uh, you can find everything in the proposal. And if you have questions, just uh, either to read wanted... it here or... Uh, or in the proposal. I wanted to ask one question. You said that you're not targeting local storage migration, yeah. but if you're gonna be able to copy between two arbitrary storage classes, why couldn't one of those, for example, be uh, local storage? Uh, could be. Um, is that, um, so before I was, uh, in the previous proposal, I was really, um, was one of the target use case, but if you specify manual manually also a PVC that's so local, you can you can do this. Okay, so maybe what's missing so, is an optimization on the yeah. QMU level when yes. when it's known that you're working with local. Yes. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, one other one other comment that I have, uh, and then I'll go and do a more thorough review in the design PR is when you talk about uh, destination uh, and source storage class, mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering 
there's a lot of uh, facts about a PVC that we yeah. normally specify, and this yeah. is only one uh, of those items. So for example, the volume mode um, in storage classes that support more than one um, mm -hmm. access modes, are we relying on, uh, on CDI and the storage profile? Um, how, you know, how do we kind of yeah. figure uh, out those values? Yeah, so right now I have just implemented the manual specification of PVCs. Um, yeah, about the migration storage class, that's something still a bit open to me. Um, I haven't implemented yet, so I don't know all the details. Uh, this is, it's listed as a second step. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was, of course, it's more automatic. Yeah, so, yeah, I need to take into account. That's also <laughs> why I, I mentioned this proposal here, because yeah, you are actually the expert. So, I was not thinking to um, rely on CDI because I think we should just use PVCs, but uh, we can all, always uh, add it on top. Or, um, um, I mean, in, in the migration storage class, we could also specify um, more fields. Uh, this is just uh, the basics. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a question about the migration storage class. Why, why do we need this? We can infer the source and the destination storage class from the source and destination PVC. Uh, so Fabian, actually, one of the feedback was that the user might not want to specify the list of PVC. So it just want to say, I want to migrate all the PVC that belongs to this storage class to this storage class. That was the usability mostly. Oh, okay. So that's why the source and the destination PVC are on their entities. Yes. Uh, so basically, when you specify the migration storage class, will be basically cube-worded fields that uh, uh, queries the PVCs, uh, sees which one belongs to that storage class, to that virtual machines, and basically creates the destination PVC based on the source PVC. I mean, all this inferring logic, I need to implement it. Uh, but uh, the the basic idea is that uh, you, you just say, I, I want I have the storage class, maybe it's deprecated, and I want to move to the other one. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um... Yeah, so I think uh, it would be great to see some extra reviews from uh, storage folks on this. Yeah, um, that would be great. For... Yeah, I just want to add a couple of uh, technical details. So this is basically uh, create a new CRDs with a new controller. Um, so basically when the user create the storage migration object, then what happens, um, there is a controller watching for this. Uh, it creates a migration uh, object. Um, it also updates in the VMI, in the status. Um, I call migrate uh, uh, volume. So basically it's this couple of uh, source PVC and destination PVCs. Uh, so then basically we trigger the migration. So we create um, a virt launcher uh, target pods where we basically substitute the uh, source volumes with the destination volumes. Uh, once this uh, the migration is succeed, then basically we update uh, in the specification of the VMI and the VM the the migrated volumes. So basically, we are replacing uh, the source PVC and the destination PVC, and uh, um, I'm also replacing data volumes, and I'm replacing data volumes uh, with PVCs. So if in the in original VM we had the data volume, I have choose to replace data volumes with PVC. So basically, because I mean data volumes are actually only for provisioning. Uh, we are I'm keeping the same name, but the object is changing. So basically, mm -hmm. after storage migration, we all, we'll, we will only have PVCs. 
Okay, so this, like, I'm, I'm not necessarily in disagreement with the choice, but um, this basically rekindles the same argument we made about data volume garbage collection. And um, the one, by having a side effect of a data volume, uh, you know, going away and there just being a PVC, I'm just kind of mm -hmm. anticipating some issues with any kind of GitOps workflows, which I guess... Uh, a storage migration is a, is kind of imperative in nature. You don't really specify. It's a transient thing that goes away when it's done. But um, I'm just trying yeah, to think about. We are, uh, yeah, but we are replacing. So originally we have a data volume and an associated PVCs, mm -hmm. uh, associated PVC. But when you migrate, it, we are changing the PVC. So. Uh, Basically, you are moving to a PVC that doesn't have a... That's fair. Yep. So anyway, that those are my design choices. If you disagree, just please uh, write a comment. Uh, it's, it's the right moment to, to... No, I think that's a good point when you say that, like, because we're, we're forcing someone to say, replace this with this. That's yeah. what the object means. If we're just not providing an option to replace a data volume with another data volume. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense to replace the, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense to replace with a, a pseudo data volume because the import has already taken, yeah. took place. So right. I think we really need to replace a data volume with a PVC. Yep. I, I don't disagree. But yeah, um, for garbage collection, we need to we need to to check. I mean, actually, it might be even be nice if the data because when the migration is succeed, basically the source PVC is not used anymore. So we could just delete the data volume, and then uh, the PVC is also automatically deleted. So. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, all these details need to be uh, clarified, so, yeah. Uh, cool, yeah, please uh, have a look, and if you have any comments, uh, please write it there, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for presenting it. Anyone else have any uh, questions or comments while we have Liche? I have a question about like backup and restore. It means that um, we will need to backup differently the VM that was created and VM that was migrated because mm -hmm. one of them will have DV and another will not have. Mm, so uh, all the object would be updated after migration. Um, so here I you need to help me a bit how this works, but as far as I understood from backups, you back up all the PVC in a in the same namespace, right? Or it's based on VM. It can be either of those. Um it's based on like labels, uh like a label selector. Um but I would yeah. think that it if a, my, my thoughts, sorry, and then I'll stop talking is, uh, my thoughts are that if a, uh, v, a VM snapshot was created where the, the PVC is on the source storage class and you restore that VM snapshot, you would get the data back on the source storage class. It just makes sense. Um, this is also a great way to roll back um, a, a storage migration. Yeah, that's also why I think we need a reclaim policy. Maybe you don't want to delete the source PVC because you have still all the snapshot. But uh, I mean, we are changing storage. Uh, we are migrating storage. So you need to update also backups. Uh, I mean, th th there could be something on top, a build on top. It's really an exceptional operation. Mm -hmm. That's a good, it's a good uh, area to, to think about, Genia, though, yeah. the, the backup area. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a quite chain, quite huge feature. So um, I think there are a lot of details. Uh, 
mm-hmm. we discover also with the implementation and for their discussion but yeah this is basically the basic idea great okay um if there are no other comments we can move to the next agenda item and it turns out we have it's just uh issue triage so we were left at 28.99 which is this one okay so um i guess we've received cdes in this way before right yes okay so um what is the i guess i would say what is the typical process that we go through to resolve these uh usually just update the version of golang and or any libraries that are affected and i actually believe for this one we we've gone to 120.7 or 8. okay I have to look it up real quick but i believe we um we updated that. Yeah, um, September third is when we upgraded to one twenty point seven. Okay. <clears throat> and and with that, I believe I also updated a whole bunch of libraries to the latest version. And some of it is a little uh, difficult because the version noted doesn't match the version that you know CentOS uses, mm. and it looks like CentOS is older, but CentOS has actually backported uh, the the PRs that fixed the particular issue. So okay, all right. Yeah, so it looks like we, you know, like for example, in this one, we're, if we're past the, if we're at 120.7, you said? Yes. If we're past, then we should be clear on this one. So I guess we just need somebody to go and uh, systematically look at these and see if we think it's been resolved. Right. I don't think we've backported this to 157 though. So 158 we'd have to fix, not 157. Hmm. Okay. Um, can I just assign it to you, Alexander? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let's go back to the issue list. And I'll scan down for where we're at. Okay. So we have a few, I guess, uh, about five more to go through. So we have a vert CTL image upload timeout. And I see that Alex has commented here. Yeah, I think the same person is, has taken it up to... Um to the kubevert dev mailing list. Okay. So a bunch of us are active on the thread and we're trying to help. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think my comment here is just a wrong impression. So All right. once we figure out the kubevert dev thread, we can close this. Okay, sounds good. So we'll move on to the next and, one. And looking at that one, his Kubernetes version is 122, while CDI is 157. So there's probably an issue there too. Mm, yeah, okay. All right, so now we have... This one has lots of comments. Blank disk with block volume mode stuck and import scheduled. Yeah, um, so there's a specific flow uh, with populators that results in like a, a weird state of a data volume. That okay. is, if you request a blank disk and you're on a uh, wait for first consumer um, uh, storage and block volume mode. Mm -hmm. 
So what happens is that you, uh, okay, so if you don't have the honor wait for first consumer feature gate, uh, you just get a pending PVC and nothing will ever consume it, right? Because for block, block blank disk would just create a pvc and leave it leave it leave it just like that mm -hmm. so um i started implementing it but then i was i got to think like uh wait a minute what's the use case and i i don't think there's a use case like if i mean they're claiming there's a use case to have on our wait for first consumer feature get off but I don't know, like for a blank disk, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, they asked to, that last comment is basically asking to implement it, but uh, like I'm not seeing an explanation for a use case yet. So I don't know, like can somebody think of a use case where you want a blank disk to um, hard coded with hard coded binding? Like why you'll always have a VM um, bind it for you. So I, I think their use cases is that they have like a cloud storage with a particular zone, and that's why they have wait for consumer. But within that zone, they have you know a, a ton of nodes that could run the VM, and uh, the storage can attach to any of those nodes, just not outside of that zone. Mm -hmm. So why why wouldn't they just create the VM? Isn't it more correct? It, it is, but that, that you essentially you want to use it like it's immediate binding just within the zone. And it's just that their storage class is wait for first consumer because of the, the zoning uh, on the storage. Yeah. What about misbinding? Wouldn't they be exposed to misbinding once they do the... Well, no, because the the, schedule, the scheduler will will start the whatever pod that binds it on on the correct zone. So they're essentially using the scheduler to make sure it ends up in the right zone. At least that's the only thing I can think of. Are you sure? Because I I'm thinking they okay, so they want us to do the immediate binding for them, and our pods are are just like a. It's something we invented, like some dummy pods. What if they bind? Like, why aren't they capable of uh, misbinding their PVC? Because our, our pods will get scheduled in the correct zone based on, on the scheduler. The schedule, they, they have a, probably have a, uh, a, a scheduler that knows how to uh, do stuff for that particular zone. Hmm. Okay. I'm 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 speculating on a lot of this, but that's the only the only reason I can think of why you want to use wait for first consumer, and you have you know multiple nodes in a zone or a rack or whatever you want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. where it makes sense. Uh, and I, I'm not hundred percent sure why they couldn't use immediate binding in that case, but maybe the immediate binding is not zone aware and. Causes an issue. I, I don't know. Yeah, because uh, this issue also came up inside uh, inside Red Hat with uh, with the SSP folks, um, common templates, Tecton tasks, and they once I explained that the use case. If, once I explained that the use case doesn't make much sense, they just that they were satisfied. So. But yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of those cases where like um, a person maybe shouldn't need to have this kind of conversation, though, like if they're just doing something across the board and, um, you know, like it's not really an error to ask for what they're asking for. Maybe it doesn't make as much sense, but like I think it's kind of almost better if we can just do the right thing um, yeah, and I not mean, bother them about the. Well, I if think it it's a bug in our code. It should yeah. work for block, is my thinking. Yeah. And I think the reason it doesn't work for block is because, um, well, with block, we don't create a, a, a pod, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, so I can uh, you can assign it to me. I already had a PR at some point. Yeah, I think the simplest is just to create a pod that does nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll just have uh, I'll just have the importer be aware that sometimes it's a uh, no. Yep. All right, next one, data volume, IO error, no matches for time, data volume. Sounds like a broken cluster, but let's see. Okay, so I see that there's been a little discussion. Hmm, okay, yep. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, they were using uh, an old version of the import uh, operator, uh, you know, what MTV used to be. Um, and that was pointing to uh, B1 alpha one instead of uh, B1 beta one. And since we removed alpha one, it makes sense that I can't find it. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So that's closed. Uh, let's go up to feature gate flag for allowing CDI workloads to run as a root. All right. Yeah. I, I just opened that one like 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. Um, Essentially, this is also based off a, a thread in Kubernetes, Dev, um, where actually I think it's the same person as the uh, blank disk one, so their storage doesn't um, support FS groups, mm. and they actually had to modify CDI to run as root. And I think maybe we should provide either a feature gate or a flag or something to allow the user to say hey my storage is stupid or you know it doesn't do what what you expect it to do please run as root uh, and i i had acknowledged that this will you know decrease my security posture um is that that sounds like a pretty large hammer um is there another way to like i'm just kind of is there something because yeah this is like broken it's broken storage kind of but yeah. also maybe that you're not required to to implement fs group support maybe so right uh um, has a flag to run as root so maybe okay. just symmetry it makes sense to have it okay yeah that's good to know but one one thing to know about the kubert flag is uh i think it's deprecated like we don't actively test it we stop like we moved it to periodics and the pre if the periodics failed then we don't make like a big deal about it anymore for for quite a while now so i think that's so i think that towards yeah so this sounds like um somebody we ought to have a discussion on kubevert dev about this and pull in like uh, a wider group of people for it because like we have as a project a goal of reducing privileges and this is going in the opposite direction so it's kind of a warning well it's the user explicitly acknowledges that yes this is not the correct thing to do but my storage or you know my storage doesn't work with FS groups, so I have no choice because otherwise they're basically stuck on 155, which is the last one where we run as root. What's their storage? Uh, they didn't specify what their storage was, just that it, that it, their FS groups didn't work with that. Yeah, it's usually we should... some NFS-based um, thing, usually. Yeah. Because we should find out and we should also like, of course, it's easy for them to just like have us paper over this. But like if their storage doesn't support FS groups, can they change NFS mount options that allows it to work on their side? Like um, the I feel like if you have um, 
you know, like a snowflake storage provider, whatever this thing is, like if it's, it's probably a weird one. If it's a major one, then I might start to take this a little bit more seriously. But if it's like some garage science project storage provisioner that they didn't want to do FS group support for, and then now we're going to have an ugly wart on our, uh, on our, like, I don't know, I'm just being, I'm kind of like just spitballing here, but I think we should know what the storage is. Um, I think it's whatever Google's um, shared network file system is. Okay. So we should we should like and, get that documented. Yeah, here. and there are similar issues with Amazon and, and EFS, um, mm. where yeah, you have to like configure your um, shares to yeah. It, it just requires more. I think if you have maybe a shared, I think it's probably harder in a shared environment to get those settings um correct mm -hmm. right and so i guess sorry go ahead michael yeah no i i just think yeah i mean the having a, a root um you know escape hatch um i, I don't know i mean i think it, can we say that this is something that you know it, is there, but we don't, you know, we wouldn't support it for like our downstream customers or anything, but. Um, I mean, yeah, that's something you can do. Uh, what This just reminds me of the days of like, oh, SE Linux is hard and I'm getting these denials. So I'm just going to type set and force zero and then everything works. And then we, we like skip along our happily, you know, along, along our way. So like, I get that allowing us to run as root would fix the problem, but like, is there another way? Like, and it could be harder, right? Like maybe we need a document that says, here's how to configure um, these particular cloud-based storages to work with Kubevert properly. Like I'm just, before we give them a, um, you know, like a just disable the security, maybe we ought to be sure that that's the only way that it can be resolved. Well, right now they're just forking CDI and setting it themselves. So. Okay, I mean this is an open this is open source. They can certainly do that if they want us to help them. Though we may want to encourage. Like I think we have we have the agency to be able to say we think that there's a better way to try to do that. And please work with us to try to find that. You know, anyone of course anyone's free to free to fork it and um, and do something, but. I'm not like I wouldn't use that as a reason to um, to go. And if I'm the only, I mean, I'm just I'm just feeling this. Maybe everybody else thinks, yeah, of course, give them the give them the, no, the root access. I'm with you. I'm with I, just, you. I feel like there, we haven't had a single comment, um, no discussion back and forth. So to just like turn like to think, yeah, we think this will fix it for you. Here you go. Um, it feels like we should probably do a little more digging first. Well, just this isn't the, an isolated case. I've definitely dealt with community members. There's um, at least one or two people that I've dealt with in, in the chat, and like what, and we've done a lot of um, point releases for like ported things back to the release where we run as root. Um, yeah. So it's it's it. This is definitely you know. This isn't something like this isn't the first time that this has come up. Is yeah, always... sure. Yeah, so it sounds you, like we should usually it's with block devices though, where you know you have to set up that flag and container D or cryo to have it follow FS groups. I think I forget exactly what the flag is, but we've told people that probably about half a dozen times already. So and and that is the better way to do it in my opinion, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, so. my experience has been mostly with N like NFS related provisioners. Yeah. So I feel like there's got to be something, you know, like a class of something we can do, or I, I don't really know the, I guess I don't have the, the alternative in my mind, but I just have this feeling like there is something. I nice think that there's things do. people can do, but it's probably a little different for everyone. And in I think you have if you have an NFS server that is shared by, you know, your Kubernetes cluster and a bunch of other stuff, it would probably in some cases, they would say, well, um, 
you know, I think it would just be better to make our stuff in the cluster run as root. Um, I, I, I think that, I, I don't think that, um, I think that there's going to be, yeah, we should definitely document and understand so that people understand the trade-offs, but I think some people may knowingly want to just go this route. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. All right, well, sorry. go ahead. So uh, also remember that they're implicitly giving up like major Kubernetes features with uh, choosing this type of storage. Um, they're giving up uh, PSA, right? No way they could do PSA enforcing if uh, in their organization if they uh, right. don't don't have FS group support in their storage. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Um, yeah, that's a big one. I think it's a major one. Like I, I I'm, I'm kind of like suspecting that they run like a old CSI driver or something like. I don't know. It it says Trident on the Kubernetes dev thread and. We know for a fact that Trident plays nice, right? NetApp Trident. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, that, there's two different people in that thread. One that started it and then one that jumped in, so. Yeah. So let's get real clear on the storage, you know, and like, I think this could be just like generally an initiative. It sounds to me like, yeah, you know, we introduced the FS group support and uh, yeah, it's, it adds complexity for sure. And some people just, you know, like I can see also like a lot of people that are doing a POC or something. I don't know where these people are in their journey, but like when you're doing a POC, you just want to get VMs running and show that it works on, on your kit. And then you're like, Oh, we'll come back and we'll, we'll tune it later. We'll fix the, you know, we'll secure it up later. And then, you know, they may or may not do that. Um, and, you know, do we want to have a whole bunch of people that are running as root and then we're going to get issues like um, things that we don't test because we're not going to test the running as root, but then it breaks in a weird way. So we it, we still will own the surface of this uh, expansion if we allow it, um, whether or not we choose to test it. Um, so I think for me, I guess it sounds like there's a thread. Um, can we get curious about the storage providers and like um, get more facts and details about it? Yeah, I'll tag them in the issue here. Okay, sounds good. Um, let's go on to the next one here just because we've got a couple more to go through. Um, actually, just one. Unsupported pre-allocation mode full, create DV failed. So I think this is just a red herring. We print out the unsupported pre-allocation modes, but then the real error is uh, the input-output error at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So so it, it did succeed pre-allocating a little bit using the dash S0 method. Okay, that's the third, that's the third mode. Oh, wait, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, right here, yep. So the input output error, that's like, uh, if I remember correctly, like bad stuff on your storage. So I don't know. It, it seems like a, not a good thing to happen. Yeah, it seems like we may want to ask them, to, like, does this reproduce all the time or like just some of the time? Because, yeah, it seems like. Pretty old version of CDI too. Mm -hmm. Maybe the underlying storage uh, doesn't let you reallocate or rather works uh, really bad with that third method of preallocation, kind of blocks it or doesn't allow it or something along those lines. I also wonder if we'd need to like throttle the IO when we're doing writing zeros, but I mean, it should no, be able I, to handle. 
I remember there was some bug a while ago that was similar to this, and it was actually um, because of an old version of QMU image. And um, okay, may have been fixed. Um, But yeah, the S0 allocation mode is just uh, writing zeros when it encounters zeros. It's not It's not like a real. Like... Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, trying to understand if this is block or file system. And it's a little light on the details. So... Mm. Yeah, if I recall, the preview, the issue before was with block. Right. On the screenshot, we say CDI block volume. Oh yeah, it is block volume. Yeah, yeah I think that this was fixed in a in, um, newer version of QMU image. And, I and I think that on that is version, it... we're actually automatically pre-allocating block uh, volume. And... Right, right, right. There was that, there was that too, right? where we switched from we were always pre-allocating um, block volumes to not doing that. But I think we reverted that and backported the revert like pretty far. Might I have to double check. Hmm. Okay, we can ask about using a newer version. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if we knew that, like, also he, they don't suggest being interested in pre-allocation. So uh, we could say also, uh, uh, like uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know, like depending on what version it is, if what the default was there, that would be a good thing. Like, um, uh, it's pre-allocation false, not pre-allocation. Yeah, no, it wasn't until 155 where we stopped forcing pre-allocation on block imports. Or at least it wasn't backported to 54. So yeah, that I just Kubernetes version seems to be pretty old, like 122. So. Okay. All right. A couple other things for me to try then. All right. So that is all of the CDI issues. And I don't see any new agenda items added since we started there. Does anyone have any last minute open floor topics they would like to discuss today? All right, sounds like no, so we can end here. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great week and we'll see you back here hopefully in, in two weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, bye-bye.